on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Metro Ford of OKC. We finish our breakdown of OU's roster by looking at the quarterbacks, and we discuss what we are excited to see in OU's spring game this weekend. And football guys talking basketball. We discuss the roster changes for Oklahoma basketball and the arena name change coming for the Oklahoma City Thunder. To finish up, we give you our winners and losers of the week. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man Mike Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Thursday, April 22nd, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Metro Ford of OKC. Metro Ford of OKC's inventory is the best of the best. In fact, they own more Black Widows and more 2021 F-150s than anybody else. They're the only Roush and Rocky Ridge dealer in the state. You can find a ride at Metro Ford of OKC that you can't find anywhere else in Oklahoma. Just like their selection of vehicles is unmatched, so is their customer service. The Metro Ford of OKC difference program is included with the purchase of every new and pre-owned vehicle. It includes free oil changes for life, lifetime window tint, lifetime nitrogen fill for your tires, complimentary wheel locks, interior fabric protection, complimentary service loaners, a complimentary shuttle with service, and a complimentary multi-point inspection. Come feel the performance when you test drive a Roush or Raptor, and come see why the difference is real at Metro Ford of OKC. Visit MetroFordOfOKC.com for more information or go to the dealership and make sure you tell them we sent you. Now, we're recording this a little earlier than normal on Wednesday, so hopefully, Teddy, uh, unlike our last episode, we don't miss anything um, <laughs> relatively significant, right? I got so many DMs. Why didn't you you guys talk about Trajan Bridges and Seth McGowan on the episode? Like, what, what are you hiding? I was like, dude, we just, we just recorded early because I had to catch a flight, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, well, you know what, that's the, um, that's the good thing, I guess, about podcasts and sometimes the bad thing, you know, is you're going to miss some things here and there, but we got plenty of time to get to it. <laughs> it's not, I, I feel like it may be hanging around for a while, so it's okay. Yeah, we're going to get right to it, but just a reminder, if you're listening on Apple podcasts, please leave us a five-star review and comment with what guests you would like to have like for us to have on the podcast. Now the Porter Moser thing, a little bump in the road, Ted, not a bump in the road from Porter's in the basketball SID has moved on. So the guy that we were coordinating with to get coach Moser on no longer works at Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So our man, Mike Houck has taken over for the meantime, so I'm gonna let uh, I'm gonna let our man Hout get through the spring game before I start bugging him let him about get getting settled uh, in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, let him get a little settled in, and, and, and then I will absolutely harass him to get Coach Moser on. Okay, we got to start with it, right? Um, so this is what we know: Trajan Bridges and Seth McGowan were allegedly. See, yeah, I'm the mm-hmm. son of two lawyers. Allegedly involved in a robbery that took place late last week. They have been suspended by the OU athletic department pending the investigation Uh, from everything we've heard. Sounds like guns were involved. Sounds like drugs were involved. And now the young men are innocent until proven guilty, right? That's how this country works. But uh, from everything I've been told, Teddy, if there's even one ounce of truth to this situation, they will never play at Oklahoma again. Uh, I mean, I, I I don't know how else to put it. It is, it's a bad situation, man. No, it is. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting here. We are, uh, we're coming up on almost a week ago that this thing happened and there hasn't been anything necessarily other than a couple of details that leaked out about uh, just kind of like the timeline of events, the 911 call that that was uh, put out and all of that stuff. We haven't heard really anything as far as an arrest being made. And honestly, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, um, I do think I would say that I think it's at least strange 
that whenever a violent crime is committed uh, with supposedly with a firearm present, supposedly striking someone with a firearm after breaking and entering, that is usually, uh, and by the way, the victim ID'd the suspects. Usually there's an arrest immediately for that. It's not something that you would typically see where uh, the police would be okay with um, supposed violent criminals with firearms out on the street. But, you know, that's just my uh, floor level view of it. That does seem strange. So I don't know if it's a good thing. Like maybe that's a sign that, you know, maybe things aren't as they seemed or maybe that's a bad sign as in they're building a case for something bigger. I just don't know. Well, that would be uh, that'd be very unfortunate if they were building a case for <laughs> something bigger. But you no, know, you listen to the nine one one call. I listened to it. It seems like everyone has listened to it. It's pretty weird. I mean, there's some weird, very weird things. I I mean, what stood out to you about the nine one one call? Because there was a couple times where I had to pause and be like, "Wait, what did what did that kid just say? Like, how did he know that?" There, yeah, there was a couple of things that stood out. Uh, first thing that stood out was how difficult it was for the dispatcher to get any information at all from the victim. The second thing that stood out was how many times the victim yelled bro at the dispatcher. That was interesting. <laughs> bro, the, <laughs> bro, bro, I just got robbed. Um, the third thing that I thought was fascinating Considering how difficult it was for the dispatcher to get any information out of the victim, uh, what were they wearing? What happened? Where are you? There was not a whole lot of communication going back and forth. But whenever the dispatcher asked if they had a gun, the victim said, yes, it was a Glock 19 with an extended magazine. And I thought that was incredibly strange for a couple of reasons. Number one, You're not given any information on anything. It's almost silence on the other end of the phone, even though the dispatcher's talking constantly and asking questions constantly. But I had a real good idea what that gun was. And if you know anything about Glocks... Which I don't. I know nothing. (laughs) I do. I've got a couple of them. They... You can't tell what the gun is. I... uh, By the way, a lot of... A lot of those types type of handguns look very similar if someone just comes in and is pointing it in your face in the middle of a robbery um you know a a black composite gun a lot of them look really similar but when it comes to a glock you can id a glock but to know exactly what model it is you have to know the caliber of ammunition um you know glock 19 can look just like a a glock 23 or or any of those it's just the the calibers what really separates him for the most part. So the fact that he said that was a Glock, it was a Glock 19 with an extended mag, it tells me that he's familiar with that firearm. As a, just a guess that he's familiar with that firearm, not as in he has one, as in like he he's has familiar a, with, that with that specific one. Right. Is what because you're saying. Because whenever he first called in, he said, I got robbed and I know who they were. So if he knows who they were and he knows the gun, I, it tells me that there's some type of, you know, real connection here. So, you know, and the, the other troublesome thing is obviously is cash and drugs. He mentioned that they stole drugs. And he also said they stole his AR-15 pistol, which tells me that, Obviously, the guy's got drugs on him. He's got guns on him. You know, I just, you, you got to kind of look at the whole, that's why I'm, my other worry that it's taken so long is they're building like a bigger case. I, I don't necessarily think that the victim is going to just come out of this thing with a couple of stitches or, or whatever. I think that the victim may end up being in some, in some trouble too. Well, that's fun. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> but that's going to make say, people feel better. That's, that's God. just a guess from me listening to the nine one one call. Yeah. 
you know, so I, I just, if you know who they are and they come in and you can identify that pistol whenever you can barely even say what apartment complex you're at or anything else, it just, that really stuck out to me. Yeah. Um, that, that seems like a detail that in that moment would be hard to gather. Huh? Yeah. That's a something to think about. Okay. So, you know, we'll continue to see how this progresses. Right. And it has gotten awfully quiet and uh, I don't know if that's a good quiet or kind of what you're hinting at Teddy, maybe that is a, you know, gathering more evidence. Maybe there's more people involved quiet, which could be uh, le less than ideal for Oklahoma football. But I was told Lincoln Riley took this really hard, man. Uh, met with his players and talked about how valuable the reputation of the program is. And uh, something that I, I was told he talked about, which I really appreciated, was that when you play at OU, you don't just represent yourself and your family, but you represent every single guy that has ever put that uniform on every guy that has ever worn Sooners across his chest. And I know it sounds a little dramatic, but it's true. And the reason I know it's true is because when I saw this news start leaking out, you know, I'm getting some text messages for, for whatever reason, I took it kind of personally. Uh, I, I don't know, like, I don't know why I felt that way, but I just felt like a disappointed parent or something like somehow I had played a part in it. I don't know why I felt that way. Maybe it's because a bunch of guys that I've played with in the NFL are sending me this going, dude, what the hell is going on in Norman? Like I had something to do with it, but it's man, it's, it's just a, it's a bad situation. And if it ends up being true, I mean, what a horrible mistake those young guys made. I mean, they're going to have to carry that for the rest of their life, but I, I don't know. I, it was kind of refreshing to hear that Lincoln Riley said some of that stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, what you're talking about is even though like for me, it's been forever ago and, and, and you played there as well, you are forever linked with what goes on there. Uh, good or bad, you know, if the team's doing really well, um, you know, you're, you're, you're a part of that too. And people want to hear about it. People want to, want to know what you know. And well, what, what, what's it like whenever you're playing for championships and stuff like that. So those are the good things, but whenever bad things happen, you're looped into that as well. Whenever something like this gives the appearance that the program has, even though we know that this is an isolated incident and, we don't even know what's there. This is just a, just allegations and an investigation at this point, but um, it, it gives the appearance that it's a dirty program, even though we know that it's not, you know, it's, right. it just kind of gives that appearance. You, you know, you have one or two bad apples spoil the whole bunch. We, we've heard that a million times, you know, we have a, we'll have a great spring game, hopefully this Saturday, but the conversation around Oklahoma is probably not going to be how good they looked in the spring game. It's going to be, boy, what's going on there at OU with, with uh, players and uh, possible burglary, armed burglary. So it's just, you're, you're forever looped in with the program, good and bad. And whenever something bad happens, it, it stings. It does. Yeah. Uh, from a football perspective, sounded like Seth McGowan uh, was kind of, falling down the depth chart. I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, minimalize the role he could have had on the team, but I do think Trajan Bridges, right, th this forces some guys to uh, really step up. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit and call your shot, but it is, it, it's a shame when you look at Bridges, obviously with what happened last year with the suspension, all the weird stuff that happened there for him. But if Trajan Bridges has put on an Oklahoma uniform for the last time I was told he went out in style last in his last practice or doing a little drill, right? Like fourth and 10, fourth and 12, something like that, you know, last play of the game type situation. Got to have it. 
And I guess he went up over three guys while getting flipped in the air to catch a touchdown. So it was plank showed me the video of it. It was awesome. Yeah. Really nice play. So um, a guy that has a ton of talent and we'll see how that whole thing plays out. But a guy that has a ton of talent and maybe made a very, very, very bad mistake. All right. Easy transition to quarterbacks, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. We, we got to finish up our breakdown of OU spring roster and just want to talk about two quarterbacks, no offense to any of the other quarterbacks, but I think uh, there are two guys that really kind of are the ones that are the, the major players in this whole thing. And let's start with the projected starter, Mr. Spencer Rattler been told that he has played really, really well this spring. They have been uh, very encouraged by the progress that he has made, has made significant progress and has made the progress that they were hoping he would make, uh, has become more comfortable in a leadership role, uh, really feels more responsible for the entire offense, not just what he is doing. And that that's the sign of a quarterback getting really comfortable, right? When he starts worrying about everything, not just his job, not just going through his reads, not just making sure they're in the right place, but that he knows what everyone on the field is supposed to be doing, and he takes it personally if they're not doing what they're supposed to do. So that was really encouraging to hear. At, at times last year, I thought he appeared to be a little indecisive in the pocket, um, maybe a little indecisive with some of his reads. Uh, I've been told that he knows and trusts what he's looking at now, that his reads have been so much better throughout the spring. And I think that speaks to how much more comfortable he is in the offense now uh, as the second year is the starter. One area they think he still needs a little work is improving his movement within the pocket. So not necessarily, you know, taking off and running when he feels that pressure, but trusting his O-line and moving within the pocket like the great quarterbacks do, keeping those eyes downfield, finding a different area in that pocket to set his feet, you know, to kind of set that platform and deliver the ball down the field. So they're still working with that portion of things with him. But Teddy, it sounds like this kid is on track to be what we all expected him to be. Well, that's, that's a good sign. You know, I thought, I thought his first year, all things considered was really good. Um, I, I thought that he was a little unsettled early in the season, but, started playing his best football uh, later, you know, and he played good early, but had a couple of big critical errors that were very costly later. He continued the good play, but cut down on the, the really bad costly uh, plays that he had. You know, one of the things that I think is going to be really interesting for Spencer, you know, Baker in 2015 was really good but he was running for his life, scrambling around. There was a ton of chaotic plays, and he did really well in that environment. Um, Spencer, I think Spencer's year last year was kind of similar to Baker's in a sense that the offensive line play wasn't tip-top. Later in Baker's career, he stood in the pocket for like seven seconds it's easy to make all those reads whenever you've got no pressure at all. You don't have to worry about it. You fully trust your offensive line and your eyes are downfield reading coverage. I think because of some of the delay in the offensive line really coming around last year, I think it probably delayed Spencer in a sense of he's worried about the rush. He's got his eyes down, worried about a tackle getting beat or – uh, you know, missing a guy up the middle. And whenever that happens, your reads really suffer. And, you know, that's part of linking being better in, with the movement in the pocket because you've got to be able to have some feel without looking at it, have, have some peripheral vision to know when someone's getting beat, 
feel the way the pocket is moving to where you can slide, step up, um, and then maybe escape if you need to. There was a lot of times last year where he escaped whenever he didn't need to, which, you know, a lot of that goes back to not trusting the offensive line. I mean, the alarm is going off in the head. I've been holding this ball for two and a half seconds now. I either need to throw it or escape. And sometimes you just don't have to. So those things come. And, you know, I, I, I think a lot of that development, though, is really going to be tied to trusting that offensive line. As the offensive line improves and he can trust that and keep his eyes downfield, I think that's whenever those reads will really take off. Yeah, and if you haven't heard our breakdown of the O-line, uh, you can go back. You can scroll back uh, into I the I saw a guy uh, respond to the, the episode, tweet it, and said, uh, this is disturbing. <laughs> We, it, we weren't that critical. Uh, once no, again, no. the O-line situation, and, and we'll see what combinations they use in the spring game, but the O-line situation, they feel good about the pieces, people. They just don't necessarily have the puzzle put together yet. Just, hey, in beating Bo, we trust. In That's beating right. Bo, we trust. Okay, there. there's another quarterback on the roster that a lot of OU fans are excited about, and that's Caleb Williams, right? Uh, the expectations for this kid are through the roof, and it sounds like the expectations may not have even been high enough mm. from what this kid has showed so far. And I know that sounds that sounds pretty crazy, but he's had a really nice spring, Ted. I mean, he has really been impressive. They're, they are thrilled with – how much time he puts in, right? With how invested he already is as a true freshman, uh, feel like he's a natural leader. Like it's just, and and we knew from the Sooner Summit thing or whatever the hell that thing was called that, you know, he was wired this way, but seeing it out there on the practice field is is different. And so they're really encouraged about his his leadership qualities. They feel like, that arm talent he's got is next level. I mean, we are talking a guy that has an elite arm. I mean, whatever term you want to use, arm strength, arm talent, the kid can absolutely spin it. And I mean, we knew we could do that, but they they said that there's a couple throws each practice where they just look at and go, holy shit, look at this kid. So that that's really exciting to hear. I'm told mentally he is much further along than a true freshman normally would be. And if something happened to Rattler and they had to start Caleb Williams for whatever reason, I don't think they feel like there would be that much of a drop-off between him and Spencer right That's now. That's crazy considering Spencer Rattler is your Heisman favorite right now. That's and, wild. Uh, when, and I had a couple – a couple coaches tell me that. And I was just like, damn, this kid must, he must be the truth because playing, uh, I mean, the jump between playing quarterback in high school and quarterback in college, I know it's probably not what it used to be, right? Because there, there's a lot of similarities in the offenses, but for a freshman to come in and impress like this kid has, I mean, that that's extremely encouraging, but been told there's a lot of improvement he can still make, obviously, right? The kid's in there as an early enrollee, but they feel like they need to clean up some issues with his footwork, which is just coaching and repetitions. You know how that thing works, but his processing and communication needs some work, right? Where, you know, there's a couple times in practice where, you know, he sees something, he knows what the defense is doing, and he just kind of hesitates communicating that to the rest of the offense. I'm not worried about that. Uh, I'm not worried about hearing those things because you get more comfortable, more confident with reps in practice. So this kid's got all the tools. Sounds like he's well ahead of where they thought he would be from a mental and leadership standpoint. I mean, it does sound like this guy is the limit for this young man. Yeah, you know, the crazy thing is he's 
He's bigger than Rattler, right? He's supposedly a better runner, better athlete with the football in his hands than Rattler. And, and that doesn't mean that Rattler's bad, but, and you're telling me that the arm talent is at least on par and he's ahead of the game as far as knowledge. That's wild uh, to be able to come in and be able to, to, you know, to step up and be that good that early in the spring. Now he's benefiting from, from having this spring, you know, I hated that the freshman didn't get it last year uh, and Spencer didn't get it last year before his first year starting. So I think that's a big advantage for him. I hope that because it doesn't matter for me in the fall, it doesn't, I don't care what Spencer Rattler does. He's going to be the starter in the fall as far as the spring game is concerned. But for content purposes, I hope Spencer has a terrible day and Kayla Williams has a great day and we could just, you know, all summer. It's like, oh, I don't know. God. I heard the workouts are going crazy. You know, Spencer's going to be your guy, but, you know, we got to have something to talk about, Gabe. Come on, man. I'm with you. You know, you know, we're all about the content, right? That's, that's <laughs> all that really matters, right? But it is, I mean, you look at OU's quarterback situation and I don't know if there's a better situation in the country, right? When you look at it and it, in a perfect world, Spencer Rattler plays amazing this year, gets drafted in the first round, and then Caleb Williams steps in and it's his team next season. Now, we'll, we'll see how that whole thing works out. But when you've got a guy as talented as Rattler coming back as your starter, and then you've got a guy who you already would feel just fine with starting I mean, that's, that's rare. Yeah. I mean, it's rare in college football and I mean, it shouldn't be that surprising with what Lincoln Riley has done when it comes to developing quarterbacks, but it just fires me up to hear it, man. I love it. I, I feel like because quarterback is so important, like there's nothing more important in football than having a great quarterback. And it sounds like OU is in a good place for at least another couple of years. Yeah, and, you know, I just saw recently, actually it's this morning, that some other big-time quarterback is between Oklahoma and Clemson and is taking official visits this summer. So not only are they in a good position on campus right now, they're in a good position as far as recruiting is concerned as well. So, you know, it's just it's amazing the run of quarterbacks Oklahoma's had, Lincoln Riley's had. It's incredible. Yeah, so it'll be fun to watch those guys in the spring game. Okay, let's get to the call your shot question. But first, let's talk money. First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs. Checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all, whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone. Everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier First Fidelity Bank also provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank at First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. And guys, spring is here and you know what that means. It is hard seltzer season, baby. And there's only one hard seltzer that we drink on this podcast. And that is Will and Wiley hard seltzer from Coop Aleworks. It's perfect for any occasion. We drink it by the pool, at the lake, and at the tailgate. It's made in Oklahoma and it is absolutely delicious. Will and Wiley is customized for the Oklahoma lifestyle. Go find it right now in a store near you and go follow them on social media at, at Will and Wiley. Teddy, little birdie told me that... uh we may be invited to a certain shindig for the launch of the Sonic Hard Seltzers that Coupe Works is doing. Just saying. Love it. I'm down with that. It's, Look at us. Hey, that's where all the movers and the shakers are going to be. Count me in. Look at us. Who would have thought? Look at us. Okay, call your shot question. Uh, just put it out there on the podcast Twitter. Who or what are you excited to see in OU Spring Game on Saturday? I got a lot of responses. This one comes from Justin Wingo. He says, center, left tackle, nickel, corners, and Caleb. 
My man Justin's going to be looking at a lot, right? Is he? He's going to better have a couple of different binocular sets on you. Is he going to be able to rewind the plays? Because how are you going to watch? Okay, you can watch center and left tackle probably mm -hmm. by just focusing on the O line. That's what I do, right? I watch the O line uh, until the ball is gone. But watching the quarterback and the nickel and corners at the same time, this could, I, Justin, I, I'm questioning whether or not this is possible. I hope I, maybe he just sees the whole field. Teddy, maybe my man's got range. Maybe he just, he's one of those guys he looks and he just sees it all. A true fan can see the whole field. You have to have good seats. You have to have one eye on the jumbotron. You have to have, uh, you, he needs spotters too. Whether it's girlfriend, kids, you need spotters to help him out there with some of those, uh, some of those matchups on defense. But you can get it done. It can be done. There's 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 fans that are talented enough to be able to see the whole field like that, and then go back and review it. Let's go. Maybe Justin is just like the fan version of Tony Romo, right? He just sees it all. He just and he's up there predicting stuff too. I hope we have, well, I don't know if it's a good thing if you have a bunch of fans that are that lined up because whenever you don't make a good play out there, don't call a good play, you're going to hear it. But I don't know. I think it can be done. You don't have to watch necessarily every single one of those positions, every single snap, but I like that he's locked in on, and those are kind of some of the positions that we talked about. Center, critical. Uh, tough battle going on there. Absolutely. Uh, tackle, critical. And nickel, I think, is I feel good about corner, backer, D-line, safety, and whatever combination ends up there. Nickel is the one position that we, we haven't had yet in Grinch's system where you've got a true game changer there. That is is really the linchpin of this defense. If you can have a guy there that's athletic and strong enough to be a physical presence in the blitz game and in the run game, but still able to cover uh, quick slot receivers and tight ends that line up in the slot, a guy that can do all of those things changes an entire defense. And we got a shot this year to be quite a bit better at nickel, well, which is big. Yeah. Well, we'll see if Jeremiah Cradell can be the guy. Let's go. Yeah. He's 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 got the chance. Okay, at Ooh, which by the way, ooh, I've I've heard that the Bowman kid who's played some at Nichols really come on lately here in the spring. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Well, I love it. High expectations for the young freshmen. So, uh, hey. May the best man win, right? They'll both play with how Grinch does it, but may the best man win the starting job. Okay, at Indy underscore Sooner says he's looking at the OL versus the DL. He says, knowing we have one of the best fronts, one of the best front fours in the nation, how the O-line performs could really bolster expectations of this being a national championship year. Okay, Indy underscore Sooner. They like the pieces, <laughs> but the puzzle has not necessarily come together the way that they want it to just quite yet. So I would not be surprised and we'll see who they end up holding out. Right. Uh, I mean, you could probably see some guys that are just going to be standing on the sideline from that defensive line. Uh, I've, and I don't know. I don't, I don't even know if they've had those discussions yet, but Let's just calm down. If it doesn't go well for the offensive line, just know they like the pieces, right? I'm just going to keep saying that, Teddy, until week one rolls around. I love it. You set the bar low for the spring game. That way we come back to this thing. It's not going to be the end of the world. We're okay. The plane has not crashed into the mountain. We got time. Got time. Uh, there's going to be a couple of offensive linemen that will not be available also, so you're probably not going to see all the combinations that, uh, that will factor in in the fall. Uh, one more, and this comes from our man, Toasty Pants. Yeah, Toasty Pants he's is back. back. So found out Toasty Pants is a nickname 
because our man is a firefighter. So shout out to Toasty Pants for saving lives. You're the man. But he says, I'll be watching the wide receivers versus the secondary. I think that will be the best matchup since those groups are the healthiest. Also, hoping for no injuries and then he throws in hashtag Toasty Pants. Appreciate you, Toasty Pants. Uh, first of all, no injuries is always the goal. So uh, I'm with our man Toasty Pants on that. I, I agree with him when it comes to the wide receivers versus the DBs, especially the wide receivers, because, and once again, we'll see how the Trajan Bridges situation pans out. But I think if Bridges is not available for this football team, that puts a lot of pressure on Jaden Hazelwood and Mario Williams. Now, some of the comparisons I'm getting from the coaching staff for Mario Williams are just blasphemous. I mean, absolutely. Like they're like, dude, he's not quite as fast, but like, yeah, the Tyree kill thing. That's kind of, kind of uh, the best comparison. I'm like, wait, what? They're like, Hey, <laughs> he's a great route runner. Like he gets it. He works hard. Like he can absolutely go like explosive as explosive can be. And I, I just keep going. What? So, <laughs> I'm going to have my eye on that kid for sure. Uh, I want to see how Hazelwood looks from a health standpoint. So, yeah, I'm going to have – I'm definitely with our man Toasty Pants. I'm going to have an eye on those wide receivers, and I'm sure since you hate joy and you hate offense, Teddy, that you'll probably be watching the defensive guys instead. Well, no, I'm, I'm excited about him as well. I'm, I'm, I can't wait to see him get totally locked down by some of these corners. That'll be great. Okay. So whenever okay. he doesn't catch a ball out there, are we ready to say that the secondary played great? I don't know. Are, but I need to back up here. Are you, are you telling people that is, it, don't watch the offensive line, watch the wide receivers? Is that where the, you're going to get the best bang for your buck this spring? Yes, I would. I would say watch the wide receivers. Maybe, uh, maybe look away at points in time. Now, once again, you you get to the end of that spring game, you're going to see some O line D line battles where you're just like, okay, I am, I'm not interested in this at all. But yeah, early on in the spring game, when uh, when they've got uh, ones on ones on the outside, that's going to be fun to watch, man. Yeah, that's going to be fun. I will say this offensively the number one thing I'm watching other than the offensive line. Cause let's be honest, that's everyone knows that's what I'm going to be focused on, but you are you're not going to see much from a schematics standpoint, which is why, why I will be looking at something that has been a huge emphasis from the coaching staff in spring ball. And that is yards after contact right? They have just drilled it into these offensive skill guys that they need more yards after contact. They need more explosive plays off short passes, whether that's bubbles, quick slants, quick outs, where they are breaking tackles and taking five yard gains and turning them into 25 yard gains or taking a five yard slant and turning it into a 70 yard touchdown by breaking some tackles. So that has been a huge point of emphasis. They're going to be tackling Saturday. So I'm looking to see how many tackles these guys on offense break because I'm sure they're annoyed about how much the coaches have just really bitched at them with this thing. So uh, I'm sure that Grinch and his staff are trying to make the offensive coaches very upset because they want to get him on the ground every single time. But yeah, it sounds like that yak is going to be something to keep an eye on. Well, I'll just tell you it, defensively playing in a spring game, there's going to be a lot of missed tackles. You're probably going to give up some explosive plays. It's and I don't know if it's the same for at offensive line, but you can never recreate a game atmosphere. You can't even do it in spring for the spring game. It still feels like a practice. And in practice, you don't tackle. It's just, it's hard to flip the switch and to be in all out game mode, flying to the football, 
bruising the offense, slamming guys to the ground. It's hard to flip that switch. So in, in the spring game, you're always going to see some plays that I feel like get out that in a typical game would never get out. But that's just me making excuses for the defense, maybe. Yeah, and, and one of those guys that I think could make a few of those plays is Eric Gray. They continue to think that this may, uh, when the season rolls around, this may be their guy at running back, just with his skill set that he's got, uh, the ability to catch the ball out of the backfield, make people miss, you know, run with power uh, as well as elusiveness. They, they're really excited about Eric Gray. And one other guy that uh, I think everyone needs to keep an eye on. So Isaiah Coe, right, the Juco transfer, missed a bunch of time early in spring ball with an injury. I've been told since he got back on the field that this man has flashed strength, power, throwing dudes around since getting back on the practice field. So uh, I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have an eye on Isaiah Co because you can never have too many badass interior linemen dead. No, and I think it just it reemphasizes the fact that our defensive line, interior ends and rush backers, the turnaround at that group is maybe the most dramatic maybe two year turnaround in a position group as far as depth production buy it whatever you want to call it maybe the most dramatic uh of any position group in a long time at OU we it was the weakness of our entire team two years ago now you could maybe argue that it is the deepest position most productive position on the entire team and that and it's not it's a it's probably the most difficult position to recruit as well. It's the most sought after position. It's it's really hard to get those top level guys. So that turnaround is just fantastic. Yeah, that uh that bodes well for that defense. Okay, let's move on to FGTB football guys talking basketball. And let's talk about OU uh first. Uh, a lot has happened in the first couple of weeks for our man Porter Moser. Davion Harmon has entered the transfer portal, portal, but also plans on going through the NBA draft process, but also has not ruled out coming back to OU if he doesn't like what he hears from the draft process, but he's also being recruited by, it sounds like everyone, I guess Kentucky is even after him. All these schools are after, after him, Gonzaga, all these people. Uh, sounds like this is a man just that just wants the uh, Cheesecake Factory menu of options here ted for uh for his next his next step in his basketball career yeah even though he's only been here what two years it's almost like the free agent that's been at one place for like 15 years and is finally an unrestricted free agent it just wants bring me all the love just bring it all in uh i'll tell you what's interesting on the list of teams that he's interested in or have expressed interest in him it, it's kind of the who's who you've got Oregon, Kentucky, um, Arkansas Texas is on there, Texas, and then BYU, which BYU doesn't have a terrible basketball program, but I was like, that just kind of sticks out like a sore thumb on that list. But um, Hey, good for him. I'm totally annoyed with the transfer portal at this point with uh all sports but it is what it is hope he makes a good decision hope he uh i'd be shocked to see him go to the draft wouldn't you yeah i don't think he's ready i don't think he's even close to ready i think he'd go undrafted but hey you you never know maybe he goes to the nba combine and kills it maybe he kills some workouts i don't know but i i certainly would love to see him come back to ou and uh, I'm okay. sure Porter Moser would love to see him come back to OU. I mean, the kid, the kid is a solid college basketball player. No, he really is. I, I think he's he was one of the more consistent guys OU had last year. I'll tell you what I do like. I like that basketball, that you can flirt around with the draft process for way longer than you can in football. Right. In football, you got to kind of make that decision 
pretty quickly and get on with it, get either go back to school or go to the draft. Got to make that decision. I like that the, the basketball where you can play around with it a lot longer and, and uh, kind of see, keep all of your options open for a longer period of time. Right. So they've lost Davion Harmon kind of not really, but kind of, but fear not the Sooners went to the portal and snagged a commitment from Duke grad transfer, Jordan Goldwire. Uh, this is a guy that was a point guard for the Dukies. Uh, wasn't much of a score, but brings a lot of experience, right? I mean, the guy played at Duke. I mean, that that's that's not easy. And he is a, an elite defender at the guard position. It, it looked like OU was going to be extremely young right at, at the point guard position next season but now they get a guy that is a super senior i mean it's a guy that just made an acc all defensive team so seems like a porter moser type of guy i know he pushes back on just getting guys that want to play defense but well gabe let me tell you it's you know i know everyone sees that they're good at defense but what they like to coach is that defense turns into offense. Yes. Get out and run transition. That's That's how we score, baby. That's how we score. Let's go team Porter. That's right. So another portal acquisition or acquisitions for coach Moser, Eastern Washington's Jacob and Tanner Groves have committed to OU. Now Tanner Groves is the bigger one. Uh, He was the one rocking the headband against Kansas. He was the one that everyone was talking about. And he's also the one that gave Kansas that 35-piece McNugget in the first round of the tournament and (laughs) had all the Jayhawks fans sweating. But he was – the guy can play. I know he – when you look at him, you don't think, oh, yeah, that guy was Big Sky Player of the Year, but I promise he was. He averaged 17 and 8. The the guy can hoop. But uh, the other Groves brother, Jacob – is the one that they kept comparing to Napoleon Dynamite during that Kansas game. So so that was funny, but he also can play a little bit, right? 6'7", average 9-4 and four last season for Eastern Washington. Teddy, I've just got a feeling that, and I know that it's the transfer portal and maybe OU fans won't, as feel, won't feel as invested in these guys, right? It's not like they're three-year, four-year OU guys. I got a feeling that uh, a lot of wigs and a lot of headbands are going to be sold and worn in that student section next year. These, these guys seem like they're going to be fan favorites just by the, uh, the initial reaction I've seen. Did we get these guys out of the transfer portal or out of the time portal? Because it looks like they're both playing from 1975, right? The short shorts, the headbands, the, the hair it's it's a total throwback look that both of these guys have but you're right they can play I mean it's a good inside presence from from Tanner he could he's, he steps out and hits the three too right yeah. that's what um, he was doing in that game I, I'm not going to pretend I, lo- I watched a ton of Eastern Washington but I watched every second of that game they played against Kansas and he was the best player on the floor wasn't even close yeah you got to give it up. Porter Moser so far has he's hit it out of the park in the transfer portal. You know, I, I don't know if, if these are people that he's had some type of history with maybe in recruiting prior, I don't know, but it, it's the three guys that we've talked about right now, the gold wire kid out of Duke and the two kids out of Eastern Washington. I mean, for a roster that we were looking at a week ago said, God, who are they going to have left now? All of a sudden, just taking some decent shape. Yeah, and it doesn't sound doesn't sound like our man Porter Moser is done. Still a couple of roster spots to fill. Uh, one other thing, Kirkweth announced he will be testing the NBA draft waters, but will still maintain his eligibility. Now, the announcement he put out didn't mention anything about the transfer portal. So it's possible that he could be back at OU. I don't know. This stuff gets all kinds of complicated. I, I can't imagine that Porter Moser wouldn't want a kid like Kirk Weth back in the program. I mean, a guy that can really protect the rim, block a ton of shots, take your defense to another level. But 
I'm not surprised he's going to test the waters. I don't think he's going to like the feedback he gets uh, as far as the NBA is concerned. Now, overseas is a different story for our man, Kirk Weth, but fingers crossed he comes back, right? Fingers crossed. Yeah, I think it would be good. He's a good athlete. He's got great length in there, can definitely affect the play at the rim. It's so weird for me because my initial thought is, Kirk Weth is going to the draft. He knows there's two rounds to the NBA draft, right? Uh, why in the world would he be going to the draft? But you mentioned it. It's different than Major League Baseball draft, uh, you know, NFL draft. There's leagues all over the world. Every continent has big leagues for the most part where you're not going to make NBA money, but you can make a really nice living. I know several guys that have played overseas, enjoyed their time, made really good money playing basketball for half of the year. So um, you do have to remember that whenever some of these guys say they're going to the NBA draft, you're like, wait a second. He, you know, he was barely a rotational guy for us. There's, there's a big market for ball players all over the world. It's, there's more professional basketball players probably than any other sport. Yeah. So I'm interested to see what happens with Kirk West. I mean, guy that can catch lobs, guy that can block shots, right? Uh, not going to be shooting any jumpers, right? It's not like he's Joel Embiid or anything. By the way, Joel Embiid is just playing. Gosh, I'm glad he's back. He's fun to watch. But we'll see. But a lot of movement, you know, a lot of change on that OU roster. Uh, and, and we'll see what happens here in the next couple of weeks because it does not sound – like Porter Moser and his staff are done just quite yet. Okay, some Thunder news. Um, now, we could talk a lot about the Oklahoma City Thunder losing games, right? I, I in fact, I, I love the Thunder. I still watch every game, Teddy, and you call me crazy for doing that. And we could talk about Darius Baisley looking fantastic against the Wizards the other night. Uh, we could talk about him going for 26 while guarding Russell Westbrook making things hard on Westbrook, right? Forced Westbrook into a bad shooting game. Did a really good job. But then we would have had discussed Bradley Beal giving him that work. Bertans hitting threes from everywhere and just didn't want to go down that road. So let's talk about the most important piece of Thunder news. And that is the fact that the Thunder are looking for a new arena sponsor after Chesapeake terminated their agreement effective immediately on Tuesday. Now they're going to keep calling it Chesapeake Energy Arena until they secure the new naming rights. Who are the candidates? What do we, I, I know you've got some opinions about this. Who, who are we after for the naming rights? Well, the first thing I thought of is, I, you may have a better idea of this than I do as far as, the pricing, but I feel like we're a couple of sponsors away to being able to throw something out there for Oklahoma breakdown arena. Um, I don't know. Is it maybe a couple hundred bucks? The a C, year? The, I think the way that our podcast bank account works, I'm not sure. I think we would have to up the spending limit okay. a little bit. But um, I we're will, missing a bunch of zeros. I feel like. Well, I will contact. <laughs> I, I will contact the people that help us with the financial side of things, and I will let you know what they say. But I say we shoot a bid out there, six hundred bucks a month or something like that. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, that that's the official offer. Let's go. Hey, we'll even do a thousand. What's up? A thousand <laughs> bucks a month, Oklahoma City Thunder. How funny would it be to have that picture? Uh, oh. <laughs> Are, are we, the, fat faces on the yeah, front of the, of front the, of the, of the arena. arena. That'd be fantastic. No, I think, uh, I think op, there's a couple that, that stick out. Do you, the, okay. So th this is something I was thinking about because one of the cool things about it being called Chesapeake energy arena was it had that local flavor, right? And, and the team, it, it feels like not only Oklahoma city's team, but the state of Oklahoma's team, right? That's how it has always felt to me. And uh, I thought it was really cool when it went from the Ford Center to Chesapeake Energy Arena because it added that local component thing, like that, that Oklahoma pride factor. 
does it matter to you if it is a local business or kind of more a bigger like national business? Does that matter? I, yes, as I think about it right now, but that doesn't mean that it wouldn't be cool if there was another national brand that jumped in and got a part of I, I think it, it would be nice whenever you're talking about expanding the Thunder brand, if you partner with a another nas- well-known company nationally, I think that, that just helps you out a little bit. Is it huge? No, probably not. But um, I would say that I would lean towards uh, a local business. I mean, and there's a couple that come to mind. Obviously, uh, Paycom is doing really well right now. That's one that comes to mind. I think you've got to think about loves with the, since they've got the Jersey sponsorship, they're kind of a big part of what goes on there, but yeah, because no one, no one has complained about the Jersey patch. So of course (laughs) loves would want to slap the logo on the arena because no one would complain about it. My God, the, the, the DMS I get still about that patch. Like the whole point is for it to be good for advertising. Like I just, you guys talk about it so much. That's exactly what they're going for, people. You're that's that's the point. Uh, well, yeah, it's like that damn loves patch. By the way, I need so to big. To well, actually, it's. Uh, I mean, believe it or not, you know, there was a meeting uh, that it's the size that the league allows. It's as big as it can be. That's funny, but I, it's kind of hard. The reason it's hard to come up with any more names because I have no idea how expensive it is. And part of me says it's got to be really expensive. The other part of me says, well, considering Chesapeake has basically been bankrupt for years and somehow it's still up there, maybe it's not that expensive. Or at least maybe the deal they signed way back when wasn't uh, expensive. It's, maybe it's more now, but... I honestly, it's, it's hard to gauge how big of a business you need to be to be able to throw that name up there. I mean, cause it is a big deal. I would imagine that it's like a couple million bucks a year. I would think so. How long do you think people continue to call it the peak even after the name has changed? Dude, every once in a while, I still call it the Ford center. So I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's going to be Which a while. I've heard people say, suggest that maybe it goes back to the Ford Center. I'd be fine with that. I don't know if you notice, but uh, there, there's a lot of Ford F-150s rolling around in the state of Oklahoma. So, <laughs> The Metro Ford Center? Ooh, Metro Ford of OKC. Yeah. If, I, if you're going to get your Ford, get one for Metro Ford of OKC. Do you have anything else that you think? You know, one of them that I thought of is... You know, there's a big push in the city in the aeronautics industry. Um, I know Boeing has a big presence here. Um, That'd be cool. Yeah, there's a company that makes drones for the military that has a presence here. I don't know what the name right now is. Oh, hell yeah. So it's they make drones that the military shoots down and they like rebuild them and put them back out there again. It's they're for like fighter pilots to test on. It's pretty cool but i i don't know that's boeing was kind of the only other one that i thought of that was national that they're trying to get a bigger presence here so i don't know though what do you think I, i've heard some people i i don't know if it would be elon musk trolling the oil uh and the oil and gas industry but i've heard some people suggesting that it would be uh it'd be pretty funny if tesla came in and like in the well, I, I thought that would be cool too, but be fine how, with me. How weird would it be to ditch Oklahoma for your uh, gigafactory to build the, the cyber truck and go to Austin and then have the naming rights in Oklahoma for the, I guess it really doesn't matter. What's a couple million dollars to Tesla right now. You yeah. know, they, it, it, their market share of the company only swings a couple billion dollars every single day with the uh the stock market so i don't know that i i could see them doing that on a whim sure what huh a couple million sure yeah do it fine sure we, we need come on expenses. elon come on elon also uh have you seen the stuff Velveeta has said about it 
you know, no. because Velveeta loves them some Dort. I mean, they love Lou Dort. I don't know how that entire thing started, but like Velveeta is, they are as big of Lou Dort fans as I am. So that's saying a lot. Like they, they love the, the liquid gold loves them some Lou Dort. So, uh, I don't know if Velveeta is in a place to do it, but could you imagine if it was the, the Velveeta Center? Velveeta no, Forum? I can't imagine that. Um, I, what does it end up being for, like, like we call it the peak. What what ends up the being Velve, like the, the, the Vita. Vita. <laughs> you go into the Vita? I, I don't know what the, uh, the, the nickname would be, so. The Dorcher <sighs> Chamber, obviously. That's still the best. Oh. <laughs> love that i feel like if it's Velveeta, we end up being a laughing stock a little bit right Punch sonic would be funny sonic and i know they kind of sold out right to what i think a company based in atlanta uh, i want to say brahms correctly brahms would be awesome just like a Barn. giant ice cream cone on the top oh. yeah. <laughs> they do make everything better ladies and gentlemen but yeah i would love for you to stay something that you know is local has kind of that meaning to oklahomans but it's not it's not that big of a deal to me right you just you you don't want to be the team that doesn't have a stadium sponsor that's a bad look right it was the same thing when we didn't have a jersey sponsor it's like hey every other team in the league's got one i mean we need to we, we need to do these things right and you know we are if we want to be a big league city right a pro city you got to do what pro cities do. So we'll see. Um, you mentioned Paycom. That feels like the most natural fit for a local company uh, with uh, how things are going for them right now. But we'll see. They may have to cut back on having those commercials with uh, Barbara from Shark Tank, if that's the case. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I'm interested in it. I, I know they're going to continue calling it the uh, Chesapeake Energy Arena. So but- there was some confusion. And so I asked around and basically you keep calling it that because the sign is up and it, it costs money to take the sign down. So you don't take the sign down and you keep calling it Chesapeake energy arena because the sign is going to remain up until they have a new partnership until they have someone that buys the naming rights. And then you switch the sign out. So uh, I think the sign has a lot to do with it there. Yeah, probably so. That's it's it's a big deal, and it's not just. I I learned this at my um, my company. I work for Chicago Title, and we used to be Capital Abstract, and with Chicago Title bought Capital Abstract way back in two thousand three, and they kept the name, um, all the way until like twenty fifteen maybe, but then we switched it. And when you switch it, it's not just, okay, we're Chicago title now. Business cards, signs on people's doors. Like, it's just, there's a huge deal to switch everything over. And I'm sure to some degree, it's the same thing with Chesapeake. Like, you can't just pull the sign down and hike the other one up. There's a bunch of different things that go into it. But um, I don't know. I, it's kind of fun, though, you know, to, to speculate on what's going to happen. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't take too long for them to find uh, someone to take over the naming rights. Okay, let's get to our winners and losers of the week. But first, do you own a business? If you do, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com and tell them we sent you and make sure you connect with our friends at Advanced Weight Loss Clinic of Sand Springs. They'll help you execute a realistic and achievable weight loss plan designed for you and only you. 
They've got all kinds of treatments for men and women. They're licensed and trained experts combine diet and exercise with hormone therapies to maximize your results. If you're struggling with low libido or low energy, Advanced Weight Loss Clinic at Sand Springs can help with that too. They also offer Botox and fillers. To get on the path to losing weight, call 918-241-LOSE or visit their Facebook page. If you mention the podcast, you will get a fee, a free fat burner injection. Okay, Ted, who do you have as your winner of the week? Uh, this is an interesting one. My oh, here winner we go. of the week is Jaden Fields, softball player from Georgia. Happens to be the sister of Justin Fields, uh, Ohio State quarterback who's in the National Football League draft. She drove in. She had two amazing plays. Uh, she drove in the winning run to end the 40-game winning streak against Oklahoma. Uh, OU softball's been on an unbelievable run. Uh, so she drives in the winning run. The other amazing play it was amazingly horrible. It may be the worst play I've ever seen in my life. She hits a go-ahead home run in like the second or third inning. It's a two-run home run. She rounds the bases, comes home, misses the plate, and is called out. But not only did she miss the plate. So whenever I first heard this, I was like, oh, there, she hit a go-ahead home run. There must have been 20 girls out there that just like piled on her as she came across and in the confusion, she missed the plate. No, there's no one there, Gabe. She even does like the run and jump like you do the big emphatic jump to like stomp on home plate and misses it. <laughs> misses it. And knowingly misses it and doesn't touch it. It just goes back to the dugout. She's called out. It's ruled a triple. One run scores. Her run does not count. And you've got undefeated Oklahoma, and this is going to be the reason you lose the game. But to be able to come back from that, I don't know how horrible that must have felt for the entire game, but to drive in the winning run after – not completing a home run amazingly she's got to be the winner of the week so i i tuned into that game and i know exactly what you're talking about and i i don't know if she just miscalculated the dis the distance or what but it was it was very odd and you could find it it's floating around there on twitter but i will say this what a bounce back by Patty Gasso's squad. Oh, yeah. Right? I, I mean. Had him down 12-0. Look, ended up being, what, 12-3? 12-3 final in the, in the second game. They played a doubleheader, and uh, I, I think they, they played that second game a little angry, but that first one was great because I'd saw, seen some of the things on Twitter, so I was like, okay, I got I to gotta find this. Uh, I got to start watching it a little bit because I, I really do love, love watching softball. It just goes so quickly. It moves fast. Um, it, it, it's a fun watch for me, but yeah, that, uh, that second game, I was, uh, I was, uh, I know the first game was thrilling and it was exciting, but I, I don't like watching OU softball lose. I like watching them dominate like they did in the second game and they beat the shit out of Georgia in the second game. Made me feel better. It did. You know, I, I, I'm the same way, but see, Baseball and softball, it's a different sport. When you make a huge mistake in football, it's its the next snap happens, and you're fully involved, and it's a physical game where you can take that out on someone. But baseball and softball, there's a lot of empty time spent in your own head out in the field. And can you imagine the rest of the game thinking, oh, my God, we're going to lose by one, which they were down by one late i think in the sixth or seventh inning they were down one run thinking we're going to lose this because i missed home plate i i would like try and dig a hole in center field and crawl into it and bury myself <laughs> i that's, that's just that was great that she came back from that i hated that it was against us but pretty cool nonetheless that's that's the thing about baseball and softball man right i, I don't know who said this but uh, you hear it a lot in baseball it's like hey if you succeed three out of 10 times, you go to the hall of fame. Right. Right. So 
I, I think baseball players probably don't get enough credit for the mental toughness component, right? They get no credit for the physical part of the game, really, right? They're just like, ah, it's not football. It's not basketball. There's no contact. Like, you're just swinging a bat. You're just throwing a ball. You're just catching the ball. Like, it, it is what it is from a physical standpoint. I, I think it's a little harder than some people think it is. But the good part of the reason I wasn't a baseball player, Gabe, is because if I struck out or I got out, I would like slam my bat into the chain link fence, toss my helmet, go in and kick something. It just it doesn't suit my personality very well. Really? Which neither does golf, but for some reason I try and play golf. That surprises me. I would never see that from <laughs> you. <laughs> All right. Who do you have as your loser of the week? I had to go with the NFL PA, Demory Smith. They've got this all out campaign. I, I guess apparently it's a bad thing that coaches want their players to come and practice OTAs. And it's like this big pressure campaign against coaches that are trying to get their guys to come in and practice. God forbid they want to try and win football games in the fall. You know, it's, they're trying to put the best team together. The coaches, I got news for you. The coaches are going to get paid the same, whether the players are there or they're not. So they're not doing it like to enrich themselves. They're just trying to put a good football team together. And I don't know. I just, I think it's weird that the year that the guys had last year where everyone's on zoom the entire time. And I know it's nice to have some time at home, but God, I'd be chomping at the bit to get the hell out of my house and go somewhere and be around my teammates and practice some football, get in the weight room and do some work. I, I, I just don't understand why they're pushing back so hard on coaches trying to get their players into practice football. It's what everyone's paid for. Yeah, obviously there's still uh, the coronavirus component of things, but dude, you, you know, as well as I do guys got a taste of that sweet virtual uh, OTAs life last year. And they're like, I want to off season. <laughs> yeah. They're like, Hey man, we do our meeting. You know, I tell them I'm working out and then I'm on the golf course by what? Like that's that they don't want to go back. I mean, the established guys, they don't care about the pay. Like they, I'll say this as an undrafted guy, like that OTAs money, a lot of people are like, oh, they don't make anything in OTAs. Well, it was more than zero. It was like 600 bucks a week or something. It was more was than there. zero. I know that. So yeah. it was better than nothing for me. Like, and you're staying in the hotel for free and all that stuff. Like you got a lot of food being provided for you. Like that money wasn't meaningless to me. Now it's, I understand it's meaningless to a lot of guys, but yeah, they're starting virtual. Then they're going to try to do some on field stuff. Then what it's going to be the mini camp is going to be the only thing that's mandatory. Like it always is, but yeah, let's just call it how we see it. We can talk about the safety protocols and everything. And I do think some guys are still concerned about that stuff, right? Genuinely concerned. And I understand that, but a lot of the guys in the league are just looking at it going, you know what? I like being home. I yeah. like being able to only have to have this one or two hour meeting and then I can do whatever I want to do the rest of the day. Right. I'm, I'm down here in Florida and I, yesterday we went and saw Cody Parkey and his wife because Cody Parkey and I lived together when we were playing in Cleveland and he was like, yeah, I mean, I've got my one hour OTA virtual meeting and then I can, you know, I get my workout in the morning and then I can go play golf. Uh, but now they are kind of screwing. The Browns are kind of screwing them with the timing of their OTA. They're going at like, it's like one to three. Yeah. It's like, it's like, what are we doing? No, no, no. Let's we got to get go. this out of, out of the way at like eight in the morning, <laughs> but it's, I, it's I'll interesting. You, the one thing, and remember the, the first couple weeks of the season this year, because everything was virtual was a slaughter of injuries. So that's the one thing to remember. And I know everyone wants their time at home and, as humans, we're naturally lazy. We'll do as little as anyone will let us get away with and still make the same amount of money. I get that, but I, it's way better for these guys, way better for these teams. The teams that show up and do it are going to be better off in the long run. 
just my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I'm with you there. Uh, I completely agree, especially they're so important, you know, getting in, getting the playbook, getting on the field and doing things so important for the young guys. And I, I will say this, I've seen some veterans, right, that have been in the league for a long time, put things out there like, hey, rookies and undrafted free agents, like, don't worry. Like, uh, you're not winning a job in OTAs. Like, you'll, you'll get your opportunity in training camp to show what you can do. That's simply not true. I mean, I think it was Cam Hayward was one of the ones I saw, and I was like, yeah, that's not true, right? right. Believe me, like, no, no offense to him. That guy's an amazing player, uh, you know, awesome defensive lineman. He doesn't know what it was like to be an undrafted free agent. Like, he was a high draft pick. Like, he has no idea. Those OTAs, for me, it was where I got the coach's attention where they were like, hey, you know what? This kid's got a chance. And that got me more reps in training camp when it rolled around. Like, if you don't have the OTAs to at least be out there on the field as an undrafted guy or a late-round pick and show that you've got a little shit to you, you got no chance, man. And, and if, if they won't put you on the field and practice, they're damn well not going to put you on the field in the preseason games. And the preseason games are already getting reduced. So please don't listen to that bullshit about all these established guys saying, oh, no, no, you'll get your chance, rookies and, you know, undrafted free agents. No, what's a lie, you know man. They're going to do, Gabe. It's a lie. They're going to go with. If, if you have a virtual off season, they're going to go with an established vet. That's why these guys are pushing for it. You see these eight, nine year guys like, Hey, caps going down. Let's make sure I don't get any of these young guys in here. Show that maybe they got, you know, some talent that it, it, it pisses me off that these people are straight up lying to these guys that could be in those situations. I mean, it's just not true. You are not going to get, your opportunity to get reps. It's just not true. That's not how training camp works in the NFL. No. When you Bullshit, eliminate, man. how many, what is, how many OTAs do they have now in the CBA? Is it, is it 10, 10 practices? Is, is it 10? I think so. Well, if you, we'll just say 10 practices and we'll say through all periods, um, inside drill, seven on seven, one on ones, uh, team blitz, all of that stuff. Let's say there's what, uh, 75, 80 reps of practice. You're talking, that's 800 reps. Okay. That are total. And your share of those, obviously you're not going to get every one of them, but it may be 200 reps that you get throughout 10 practices, of OTA. You can't ever make that up. You can never make that up. And being half asleep on a zoom call at 8 AM is not how you make the team. You make the team by blocking people, tackling people, uh, you know, deflecting the football. So I don't know. It's frustrating. Yeah. And I think technically, I mean, because you can do a practice and a walkthrough, right? So, mm -hmm. but a walkthrough is not like a real practice. I think it's 10. I could be very wrong. And I'm sure someone will tell me if I'm very wrong and I'm fine with that. But don't listen to all that. Oh, yeah. Those guys will get their opportunity. That's <sighs> okay. 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 You only got a window like this too. Once you're yeah. established, you've got like a two or two, three year window to kind of float around, hang around. I remember you haven't made a roster. It was like halfway through, you know, e even like rookie minicamp is important. Like all that stuff's so important, but I'm just saying, man, that you, you need, when you're in that situation, you're a late round guy or an undrafted guy, you need every opportunity you can get to show that you belong and OTAs is one of those opportunities, right? Even the workouts, like showing that you can run, showing that you can lift, like everything matters. Like the strength coaches report all that shit yep. to the coaches. So, I mean, the, this, Oh, you'll get your opportunity. It, as you can tell that rubbed me the wrong way a little bit, but you know, what doesn't rub me the wrong way? Riverwind. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience. Don't forget that Riverwind's number, prior, number one priority is your safety. There are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts, I'm just going to mess up every word in this ad read, but it all starts with their amazing winning environment. Okay, here we go. <laughs> 
amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including blackjack, blackjack match, roulette, and craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And Fridays in April from 6 p.m. to midnight, you can win your share of $100,000 in cash and bonus play in Riverwind's baskets and cash promotion. All right. If you need help finding your way, just visit riverwind.com, Riverwind Casino, simply the one. And don't forget to send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence. They know that children need to be in school and are doing everything possible to make that happen. Bishop McGinnis students were welcomed back last August and saw very few interruptions in 2020. With a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio, no student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis' college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. Okay, so for my winner of the week, thought about going with Steph Curry. That man is on another planet right now. Uh, It's looking like he may average 40 points for the month of April with his which is just absurd, but he scarred me a little bit throughout the years, so I'm not going in with him. So my winner of the week, popular golfers. Hmm. So one of the tough things about golf is no matter how popular you are, like even if you're making tons of money on endorsements, you still have to go out in tournaments and play well to win money, right? To win money from the actual tournament. Like you're the most popular guy in the world. People may be coming to see you, but if you don't go low and finish and, you know, make the cut and then finish and, you know, top 10, top five, that type of stuff, you're not making a ton of money from the actual golf portion of things. But that appears to be changing, Ted, because... When you look at what the PGA Tour is doing, they I I read an article by Bob Herrig. The PGA is putting together a bonus pool of $40 million that they will give to their most popular players. So it's all about rewarding guys that bring in money. And we hear the term moving the needle a lot when it comes to golf. So... For these guys, these 10 guys, it's it's all about fans wanting to see them play in por- in person or on TV. It's the guys that bring in sponsorships for the tour. So there will be bonus payments in this new incentives program to the top 10, and that will be based on something they are calling the impact score. The <laughs> impact score. Uh, that will be determined by a bunch of different metrics, right? Where they can gauge, you know, the ratings, their popularity and all that stuff, uh, which will include their popularity in Google searches. It will include how popular they are on TV and social media. But Ted, this is a way for the, for the guys that bring in money, but may not necessarily pe- be playing that well at this time, Ricky Fowler, Right. I'm talking to you, by the way, saw Ricky Fowler walking down the street. Uh, I was going to dinner with Parky. They live like a couple houses down from each other. He's just walking just out on an afternoon walk. And I wanted to be like, dude, congrats. You're going to make a ton of money through this new PGA tour thing. You so, should have said, hey, why don't you go hit some balls on the range? You're playing terrible right now. Uh, just decided to leave that man alone. He's got <laughs> enough to worry about, but I'm sure he's thrilled about this, but I thought this was pretty cool. Right. The guys that, bring in a lot of money, deserve a little cut, right? Remember, these these players, these popular guys are what the tour uses to leverage TV deals. They don't get cuts of that, right? So I've, I'm all for it. Sounds kind of awesome for the popular golfers that may or may not be uh, playing that well. Well, here's... here's <laughs> Uh-oh, there's the flame inside. Here we go. <laughs> well... All right, so the NFL has the what's called the performance pool, performance bonus. So what happens is there's a big chunk of money that is set aside on every team, and 
it goes, you get a bonus that is not tied to your contract. This is completely separate. You get a bonus based on how many snaps you play during the season. And the bonus is paid a, like conversely to your salary. So this and is a way. Position. Yes. So this is a way for guys that are undrafted free agents or late round picks that make league minimum and didn't get a signing bonus that if they end up being a starter or a big contributor on special teams and build up a bunch of reps, they end up getting a huge bonus at the end of the year. And that's a way for them to, to see a part of the action. So I wish it was kind of tied in and maybe it is to the PGA that way to where let's help some of the guys out that, you know, aren't making a ton of money on tour, but you know, they're, they're still bringing people in. They're still big factor with what we do because otherwise I feel like this has just been a scheme cooked up to pay Tiger Woods $40 million a year for not playing anymore because I got news for you. Even though he's not going to even play, he's going to move the needle more than anyone else by sitting in a wheelchair on the 18th green, watching the guys come in. I mean, that's, that's going to move the needle. Tiger Woods is still going to bring the biggest amount of fans to the sport, whether he's hitting a ball or not. So I don't know. I, it is interesting though, but I feel like it's going to end up being a bonus for the guys that are winning. Anyways, there's a couple of guys like Max. Be Holma, that doesn't he have like a, a pretty big following? Um, yeah. Social media. He does yeah, a good job with that stuff. He's played better, but. I don't know. I kind of feel like it's going to be end up being a pot for the guys at the top that are already winning everything anyways. Which I'm fine with because fine, it's the yeah, reason that, hey. yeah, that people are tuning in. And it's funny you mentioned the Tiger thing because I, I saw a quote from Brooks Kepka that was like, yeah, uh, Tiger deserves that money every year. He's the reason we all make so much money playing golf now. <laughs> like I'm perfectly fine for it. It was like the most Brooks Kepka quote of all time. I will say this. I almost made myself the winner of the week because Teddy, you'll love this Saturday. We're playing golf out of Troubadour, which is the new discovery course South of Nashville. And we, we were playing there. It's this bar in between holes one, two, and three. And we, we just finished and we're sitting there drinking and there's like 15 golf carts. And I'm not exaggerating like 15 golf carts uh, by the tee box of the second hole, which is a part three. And these guys are just firing at it. And I mean, right at it, bro. I'm like, damn, these dudes are legit. And just huge group of guys. And I, I don't think anyone ended up making it, but a uh, guy hit the flag stick in the air. It was pretty sweet. And they come up to the bar that we're sitting at. And it's Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth, and a bunch of their buddies. And they are feeling good. And it was so cool to watch those guys hit golf balls. I was just like, this wow. is awesome. I played Did it you? cool. I was wearing an OU thing too. And, uh, you know, chatted with a couple guys for a while. But, you know, n no OU stuff came up. I was glad. I was wearing an OU pullover. I was like, uh-oh, here we go. This could be <laughs> awkward. <laughs> you should. I wish you would have asked Spieth why the hell he took so long at the British Open that time, running up and down that hill. Oh, that still makes me mad to this day. Uh, see, next time I see him, which I assume will be never, uh, I'll ask him. I'll be like, hey, man, my buddy's got a question. Uh, British Open. What? I guess it's the Open. Now, but that was cool. It's that is I'm cool. always, I played it cool. I played it cool. Didn't make anything awkward. Just say, hey, what's going on, guys? You know, played it cool. I take pride You've in got some weird thing where you bump into all these professional yeah, golfers everywhere. I wish it was like, in a situation where I was better at the sport, but Hey, I'll tell you this gains. We're getting some gains but coming around. Huh? It's coming. I, I am encouraged. That's what all I'll right. put. It. It's all about the positive energy, right? Positive vibes. I'm encouraged, but also watching Good. those guys fire at that part three. I was like, Oh, I got a long way to go. I'll never yeah. get there, but it was, it was cool. It's always cool. Watching. Well, they've been doing it their whole life. Why don't you ask them to go do like some board drills with you? You know, you'd be, yeah, let's go. Hey, let's go hit the sled guys. Come on, <laughs> let's do it.
Okay, my loser of the week. Uh, thought about going with the Brooklyn Nets because, man, they keep having issues, right? KD banged up again. Doesn't sound like it's serious with the uh, thigh bruise. But James Harden, this is a guy that even after what he did to Houston, like he was in the conversation for NBA MVP. He gets hurt with the hammy and on Monday has a setback with the hammy. Uh, the, the quote was that he is back to square one. Uh, something happened in, uh, you know, kind of a rehab session on the court with him. So he hasn't played for over two weeks now, and it sounds like he'll he'll be out indefinitely. So hmm. that's just got to be worrisome for the Nets, man. Massive. Uh, this is just a huge shock to me. Who could ever think that a guy that sat around and got fat, 40 pounds overweight, uh, demanding to be traded could be fighting hamstring issues throughout the season. It's just strange how some of those things end up working out weird. <laughs> it is a little weird, but I will say this. Harden has always been like an Iron Man, right? Yeah. I mean, he plays and plays and plays. It's weird seeing him miss extended time, but my loser of the week, it's got to be the Super League. I mean, this thing popped up and died quickly. So if you are, if you don't follow soccer and I'm not going to pretend like I'm super into international soccer, but uh, this is pretty much the most popular story in sports right now. So they announced how the super league was going to work. It essentially was going to be different than how soccer has been different internationally forever. And, uh, the, the soccer world freaked out about it. I mean, soccer fans freaked out. Uh, some of the players spoke out against it. Uh, FIFA and UEFA freaked out. I mean, UEFA even threatened that if, for, you know, the players that were going to play in the Super League, they, they threatened those players by saying they wouldn't let them play in the World Cup, right? Wouldn't let them play for their national teams. I don't even know if they can do that, but they said it and they put the threat out there and it seems to have worked because there was so much outrage and backlash. I assumed, now I assume the owners of the 12 teams that were going to be like, they've been plotting this for a while. Like, it's not like this just came together overnight, but it just came crashing down in a few days. It's like, they didn't have much of a plan to present it. They're like, all right, here's the press release. I, I mean, one owner, maybe said something publicly about it, but the rest of them, like you didn't hear anything, but you look at it a couple of days later, all six English teams are out man, city, Liverpool, man, you Arsenal, Tottenham and Chelsea. They're like, never mind, bad idea. We're out. Once they bailed a couple of the, uh, what was it? Inter Milan and Atletico Madrid bailed. They're like, yep, sorry. They all, <laughs> they all issued their own statements. Like, Hey, our bad, we didn't, they should have just said, didn't think you'd freak out this much. Our bad. <laughs> but the Super League, I mean, it's the, the backlash was so bad. And then all the teams started bailing. The Super League has announced the project has been suspended. So maybe they should have been a little more organized with the old rollout, Ted. Uh, the Super League came and died quickly. What a bunch of losers. Okay, you That's get why they're my loser of the week. Yeah, perfect. Exactly, it's perfect. You get the what the twelve biggest and best soccer clubs in the entire world, and they say we ruled this thing. We're going to start our own league. Which, quite frankly, sitting over here in the United States, I think it sounds awesome. I'm not ever going to tune in to watch any of these teams play another team that I've never heard of. If I'm flipping around and uh, Chelsea's playing Man City or so, okay, let me see what's going on here a little bit. I'm never going to watch any of those other games. So for me, it's perfect. You've got the biggest dogs and they decide, they work on this thing and they're, we're going to start our own Super League. It's going to be fantastic. The rights are going to be, for TV, are going to be huge. This is going to be great. And they all fold like a cheap tent at the first sign of any pushback at all. What a joke. These guys are pathetic. That's the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. I've, 
Have you ever heard of a deal going that poorly to where everyone panics and sells instantly? It's like, oh, sorry. Ooh, oh, my God. We upset some people. What they think was going to happen? This is it's like, the- come on, guys, <laughs> stick together. This is the fire fest of pro sports leagues. <laughs> it's I. Okay. So you mentioned like, I'm with you, right? This is how American professional sports is, right? We, I mean, the NBA is, Hey, there's 30 teams. These are the teams. We watch these teams and we're all fine with it. It's the same with the NFL. Now soccer is right. It's supposed to be the, common man's game right with how they do relegation and you know how teams can get elevated into the top leagues by winning like it's not a exclusive club like their whole thing is hey everyone's got a chance to make it to the show you you just have to win right it, it, it's about winning and even you know the, the the common man has his chance yeah, I mean, that's great for them, but I'm with you. I would have loved to see it. I would have watched the shit out of that league, but people did freak out, man. It was all over my timeline. I don't follow a singer, like a single soccer person, I don't think. And it, I mean, everyone was talking about the Super League. It would have been you awesome. Want. You want everyone talking about the Super League. You want everyone talking about how stupid it is. And then whenever it happens, they're going to tune in to see how stupid it is. And when they tune in to see how stupid it is, they're going to actually like it. And whenever they actually like it, they're going to always tune in to watch it. This is perfect. You want it to be insane whenever you announce it. Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's probably a little more to it. It's you look at FIFA. I think FIFA runs UEFA. And obviously this would have been a huge hit to them so it's not like i i don't feel like this is a you know for the love of the game situation for those right. people right it's all about money right just like everything is sure but there is what there, it's going to be interesting because i mean this got out right i mean they rolled it out press release and everything and now they're all like oh just kidding it's going to be interesting to see how these teams uh these teams do over the next couple of years, right? I, I think there's going to be some resentment there uh, for these clubs. Look at me, clubs. Yeah, I talk soccer. What's up? But uh, I'm interested to see what the consequences will be for uh, for this betrayal. It's kind of like they were, you know, they were married. They're texting someone else. You know, nothing happened, but they're texted. It's a little weird. The, the husband or wife finds out, you know, type of situation. It's like, I didn't do anything. I, did, I wasn't actually going to do it. I was actually <laughs> just like, okay, okay. I, I am interested to see how the fans react because, I mean, some of these videos I've seen, these people were like hurt. Like they were traumatized by the thought of this league. I was like, damn, I didn't know it was that serious. But now I know, man. Well, good for them that everyone folded. And they're right back to where they were before. They lost all of their leverage. They didn't even ask for a better deal with where they are. They just went right back to what they were doing. So weird. RIP Super League. (laughs) And on that note, episode 105 is in the books. We'll have a new podcast that will drop Monday morning. Of course, we will recap OU's spring game. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 2 to 6 on Sports Talk 1400. You can hear me from 3 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio Channel 375. Hope you all have a great weekend. Until next time, we appreciate y'all for listening. And do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.